Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum everyone and welcome to Divine Allegiance. I'm your host, Maulana Beg. Thanks for joining us. Today's topic, Islam without Imam Ali. Is not Islam at all. When we look at the relationship of Imam Ali to Islam, we see that it's a very deep-rooted relationship. Both Islam and Imam Ali were raised and brought up by the same man. If Rasulullah raised Islam, the same Rasulullah raised Imam Ali. They both are akin to each other and close in affinity to each other. When we see the role of Imam Ali in Islam, we need to ask the question, is accepting Imam Ali as the Imam one of the wajib actions of Islam? Or does it go deeper than that? that it is one of the main obligations of Islam. Like for example, prayer. Being one of the main obligations. Is acceptance of Imam Ali one of the main obligations? Or does it go even deeper than that? That the acceptance of Imam Ali is essential to Islam itself. It is a condition for Islam. Otherwise, without it, it would not be Islam at all. Like for example, Tawheed. Like for example, Nabuwat. Without Tawheed, there is no Islam. No one can say, for example, I pray and fast, but I don't believe in Allah. What's the use of the prayer and the fasting then? Or for example, if someone says, I pray five times a day and I fast and I go for Hajj, but I don't believe in the Prophet. I don't think he was a messenger. So obviously, the fasting and prayer, all of that is useless. So, is Imam Ali like that to Islam? That he is necessary without which it is not Islam at all. Is he indispensable to Islam? That is a question that we want to ask and answer today uh, in these, this time that we have. So, let's start right away and go to the Quran. I chose this verse of the Quran, which is known by most Shias by heart uh, and many of other people also in Surah Ma'idah, ayat number 67. Because in this chapter, Allah is asking the Prophet to make an announcement. And the reason this ayat is strange and also one of its kind in the whole Quran is because in this ayat, Allah actually has made a threat to the Prophet about not delivering the message, not making the announcement. That is strange because he has never done that before. Whatever Allah has said to the Prophet, he has done without any fault, error or hesitation. The Prophet is always ready to do Allah's work, never step back from doing it. But in this ayat, Allah gives that threat that if you don't do this, then there's consequences for that. So here, let me first translate the ayat and then we'll go into the different aspect of this ayat and figure out what is it that Allah wants to speak about here and what is that message that he wants to give. So here, Allah says, Ya ayyuhar rasul, O prophet, messenger who's giving my messages. Balligh ma unzila ilayka min rabbik. Announce to them that which Allah has given you. He has revealed to you. Announce that to the people. Deliver that to the people. Wa in lam taf'al. Now here's a threat. Wa in lam taf'al. And if you do not do that, if you do not announce it, if you do not deliver it, fama balagta resalata. You have not announced anything at all. Meaning this issue, if you do not say it, then you haven't said anything at all. All that you have said is going to be worthless if you don't give this message. Wallahu ya'asimuka minan nas. Allah will protect you from the people. Don't worry about these people. Allah is going to protect you against them. In Allah la yahdil qawm al and Allah does not guide the people 
who are infidels. So he will not let this message reach them. Don't worry, they cannot do anything to you. So this is the ayat. In short, what is the, this is the translation of the ayat. Now let's go and see what does that, this ayat actually mean? What can be so important in Islam that without it, everything else is useless? What is that one issue in Islam that without it, everything else is rejected? So this issue is obviously very crucial to Allah and to Islam. That Allah is speaking of it in these terms. Some people theorize when it comes to this ayat that, well, no, actually, Allah is speaking about the whole message and telling the Prophet that Islam is like a puzzle. If one of the pieces is missing, then the puzzle is incomplete. So all the obligations and all the haram things make up Islam and if one of them is missing, it would be incomplete. And that's what Allah wants to say in this ayat. Well, if that is true, and that could only be true if all the actions in Islam were the same. If all the wajibat were at the same level, and if all the haram things are at the same level, and if every message is of the same importance, then yes, each and everything is dependent on each other. And they're all a big part, a part of a whole. And if one of them is missing, it will make the whole incomplete. So let's see, is that the case? When we look at different aspects of Islam, we'll see that. In wajib things, hajj is wajib, fasting is wajib. Allah tells and makes it wajib in the Quran, both hajj and fasting. But tell me, if someone goes for hajj and doesn't fast, is his hajj invalid? Or if someone fasts but doesn't go for hajj, does that fasting become invalid? Which wajib is dependent on which wajib? All of them, and we all agree on this, all the Muslims agree on this, if you don't fast, you can still go for hajj, your hajj is still accepted. And if you don't go for hajj, you can still fast. Or for example, zakat and amr bil maruf, both of them are wajib. To pay zakat is wajib. So now, if you don't pay zakat, but you do amr bil maruf, you love to tell people what to do, so you tell you do amr bil maruf, but you don't give zakat. Is your amr bil maruf rejected? Does Allah say, no, if you do zakat, then I'll accept this? Or for example, if you give zakat, but you don't do amr bil maruf, you are one of the nice guys who don't say anything to anyone. So if you're like that, does anyone say that, no, your zakat is not accepted if you don't do Amr bil Maruf? So one wajib is not dependent on the other wajib. We all know that. And they're not the same. For example, two haram things aren't the same. Looking at a woman is haram. For example, someone who's non-mahram to you and you look at her, it's haram. And doing zina and adultery is haram. But they're not the same. One is greater than the other in its gravity, in its severity. So we understand that. If then this theory is incorrect. So let's now just go and find out what is that one thing in Islam that Allah is speaking about in this ayat, that if you do not do this, then neither your, the rest of the Islam is not accepted. And the person who is rejecting this is called a kafir by Allah. Yes, he is called a kafir. Allah says, Wallahu ya'asimuka minan nas in the laha la yahdil qawm al kafirin. Allah does not guide the people who are kafir. And so the, that person would be a kafir who rejects this because the Islam is not being accepted. This issue is important. Now I'm going to mention some of the things that we can derive from this ayat. Some things on the outward, we don't even need to go deeply just looking at the meaning of it. Nine things I wrote down that you can derive from this ayat as to what Allah is saying. First, number one, the prophet has a fear of public outrage. 
When you look at this ayat, it shows that Allah, when he tells the Prophet, don't be afraid of the people, it means that Prophet is afraid of the people or is having some sort of fear regarding the reaction of the people. Now, when you look at that, the Prophet is not someone who's going to be scared to give the message. If Rasulullah was in the outset of Islam alone and stood up against the rigid animosity of the kuffar and infidels of Mecca, when they threatened his life, when they started bribing him and they started coercing him, and all of the things that they did in terms of torture, if Rasulullah did not bow down there and stop his message and delivering Allah's message, why would he now be afraid of doing that? So it is not because of a lack of courage that the Prophet has a fear. The fear is something else. So, but we see that there is a fear. Number two, Allah reassures him with the promise of protection. Allah reassures the Prophet that I am going to protect you. No matter what happens, I am going to protect you. Third, this issue has more value than the rest of Islam. Why? Because Allah is saying that if you don't do this, nothing else will be accepted. So it has more value. If it's not accepted, number four, if it's not accepted, then the whole of Islam is nullified. If you don't accept this, then the prayer, fasting, hajj, zikat, all of these things are nullified. If you don't accept this one issue, this is just from the outside of the Quran we are learning this. We don't even need to go to tafsir for this. We are just learning it as to what Allah is saying clearly in the Quran. People will protest and dispute this issue. That's another thing we get out of it. Because Allah says that he will protect you from the people. It means that the people will rise up. They will object to the message and to this issue. And Allah is going to protect you. So there is the fear of the objection of people. And Allah is saying they will. The Prophet is aware of the objection of the people. That's going to happen. That's number seven. The people who are going to protest are Muslims. Not kuffar. It's the Muslims who are going to protest. Why? Because the Kuffar are defeated, they're gone, they're eradicated from Arabia. Now the only people that are left there are Muslims. So when you look at Muslims, it's the Muslims that are going to protest and object to this message that is being given in this ayat. And number nine, this ayat and the issue about this ayat is going to change Islam into kufr, meaning anyone who claims to be a Muslim, if he rejects this issue, is going to become a kafir. This is really important and it's crucial and we are hitting the crux of the matter. Now, let's see what this issue can be. What is this issue that is so important to Allah that Allah is saying that nothing in Islam that Islam will not remain unless this issue is established so now let me just go into the types of Muslims there are because Allah is speaking to these Muslims and we need to understand that first because we need to know the audience at that moment Muslims are not the same type they are those people who are true and sincere amongst the Muslims these people who are steadfast and they do believe that Allah is there and they do believe that the Quran is divine and they do believe that Rasulullah came from Allah as a messenger. Then there's the hypocrites who do not believe this at all. In fact, they ridicule it and they are just hiding in the disguise of Islam because they have no other choice now. Then you have the insincere people. They're like, okay, accepted it but they really are like in doubts of their own. They have their own mindset, their own thoughts and their own ideas. They're also there amongst Muslims. Then you have the simple minded people, which is always the case in any society. You will have simple minded people who believe in anything. They go along with anything. Their faith is not deep rooted and they will accept anyone who says anything and they'll go along with that. So that's one group of people. And then there's a fifth group of people who follow the law of the land. 
They are citizens of the country. Now they look at the Prophet as the new ruler of Arabia. So since he is the new king and the new ruler, so he is going to make the laws and we are going to follow the laws. They don't believe that there is a God or some divine revelation or any of these things. He is just the ruler of the land and a lot of the people who accepted the Prophet in Islam after the conquest of Mecca fall into this category. They fall into this category. To them, Rasulullah is a king. He is a king. He is the ruler. He can do whatever he wants. We are under him. So it's better just to go along and do what he says. Do they believe that there is revelation, divine revelation? No, they don't. Do they believe that the messenger is from Allah? No, they don't. All they know is that he is the boss now. He is the chief and we just have to listen to him and everything will be all right because that's the law of the land. So in this regard, when we look at these people, the message if has to be given regarding this important issue that Allah is saying that if it's not accepted, then the rest of Islam is not accepted cannot be given in some normal setting or an ordinary circumstance. For example, Allah is saying, hey, listen, pork is haram and don't buy meat from haram places and Ali is your wali and, you know, and here we go. It cannot be like that because if this message is so important, then the setting and the venue and the location and the onset of what Allah wants to give has to be extraordinary. It has to be exceptional. It has to be special. It can't just come on a normal occasion like the 10 ayat for today that came down. One of them is that Ali is the wali and that Ali is the leader or announcement for leadership. Oh, you know, and by the way, there's an asterisk next to this one out of the 10 ayat that came down today that if you don't accept this, everything else is useless. It can't be like that. It has to be special. And that's why the ayat came down, but the occasion was delayed. The occasion was delayed until the right occasion. Allah wants to stamp this message in such a remarkable way, in such a historical event that everyone who was there is going to remember it. They cannot forget it. It's going to be memorable. It's going to be memorable. And that occasion came in Ghadir Qum. In Ghadir Qum, the occasion came for this message. Rasulullah in the middle of nowhere stopped himself, stopped the caravan, called the people back, waited for the people to come who were lagging behind. And everyone in the middle of nowhere is wondering, why did we stop here for? It's hot. There's no shade. Why are we here? There's a message to be given. Okay, can't we wait until we get to Medina? I mean, all the other messages were in decent places. Why we come over here in the middle of nowhere to give this message? It had to be done that way. So it remains in the minds and hearts of people forever that this message is not just any ordinary message. It is the central crux of Islam. Without it, there is no Islam. And that's when everyone was gathered. The stage was set. Rasulullah in that special gathering brought out Imam Ali in front of the people announced his leadership and he made him the successor and said he is my successor Allah's representative and your leader after me and after saying that and establishing Imam Ali as that he asked everyone to congratulate Ali no other ayat if you look in the history of all the ayat that came down in the shan and nudul of every ayat that came down, no ayat got this sort of treatment that this ayat got. Why? Because it is the foundation of every other message. It's the foundation of Islam. So now what was it? Allah says, after revealing it, Al-Yawm akmaltu lakum dinakum. Today I have completed your religion, meaning without this, religion is incomplete. 
I have completed my favors unto you. All the blessings have been given to you through this message. وَرَضِيتُ لَكُمُ الْإِسْلَامَ دِينَ And I am pleased at is, as Islam, I'm pleased with Islam as a religion. In other words, without this, I am not pleased. So, Islam is complete with this message. Without it, neither is Islam complete, neither is Allah happy with that Islam that doesn't have Ali in it. So, in short, my friends, Ali's leadership is so crucial to Islam that Allah is saying in the Quran that without Ali, Islam is incomplete. In fact, it's not Islam at all. You can call it anything else you want. You can give it an Arabic name or a foreign name or anything like that. It cannot be Islam. It can only be Islam if Ali is the leader of that movement. That is the only place where it could be Islam. And this is not something new. For example, Allah rejecting the actions in the prayers, in the obedience, in the service of people who served him when they rejected his representative is not a new thing. In fact, in the Quran, Allah has mentioned this and in the history, he has shown this in the example of Shaitan. Yes, Shaitan worshipped Allah for 6,000 years. For 6,000 years, he served Allah, worshipped Allah, had no problem in praying to Allah and bowing down before him and prostrating before him, had no problem with that. And the one mistake that he made is that he refused to make sajda before Adam. Adam, who's Adam? Allah's Khalifa. Allah says, Inni ja'ilun fil ardh Khalifa. I am making a Khalifa on the earth. So, Adam was the Khalifa that Allah has made, representative that Allah has made. And Shaitan said, well, you know, one thing I won't do. Everything else I'll do, I'll pray, I'll, I'll serve, I will be obedient and everything except for this one thing. And when you don't do that thing, what happens? Well, here's what happens. Allah says, إِذْ قُلْنَا لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ أُسْجُدُوا لِآدَمَ فَسَجَدُوا إِلَّا إِبْلِيسِ He told the heavenly beings to make sajda to Adam and they all did except for Iblis. أَبَى وَاسْتَكْبَرَ وَكَانَ مِنَ الْكَافِرِينَ He refused, he was arrogant, and he is a kafir. After 6,000 years of worship and obedience and service, Allah announced without any hesitation, you are a kafir. That's it. So to Allah, he doesn't care if you just uh, prayed for 23 years. If he doesn't care for 6,000 years, then 23 years is nothing. And that's how long the Prophet announced Islam until his death. So if you are a Muslim for 20, 23 years to Allah, that's nothing. If you do not accept the Khalifa that Allah has appointed, then it is not Islam at all. That becomes kufr. And such was the case where a person who uh, protested right away, he protested to what happened, came to the Prophet and said, tell me, this appointment of Ali, is this your idea or is this Allah's idea? In front of everyone. And everyone was there watching him. He said, is your idea or is it, Allah's, is it Allah's idea? If it's your idea, I refuse to accept it. And if it's Allah's idea, then let Allah send a punishment on me, an azab on me. So, a stone came from the heavens, from the sky, and fell right through this person, smashing him. Everyone saw it. They looked at him. He was flattened. He was completely annihilated. And then this verse came down after this happened. Sa'ala sa'ilun bi'adhabin waqi'in lil kafirin. The questioner asked about the adhab and the punishment that is meant for the infidels. In other words, anyone who opposes this message of mine is going to be branded and kafir and infidel and he is going to get the punishment of an infidel. So this has become clear now that 
The relationship of Ali to Islam is that Ali is indispensable to Islam. He is central to Islam. Without Ali, there is no Islam. Without Ali's imamat, there is no Islam. Without Ali's wilayat, there is no Islam. You can claim it as much as you want. You can have as many numbers as you want. It won't matter. Rasulullah had said that if you see the whole ummah going one way, and if you see Ali going this way, then just go with Ali and you will be safe. If you go with the other ones, then you are going to get drowned with the rest of the ummah. So Ali himself is heavier than the rest of the ummah, is more important than the rest of the ummah. And Islam is going to go with him no matter where the ummah is going, no matter where the nation is going, it doesn't matter. And this is something that Allah is clearly mentioning in the Quran and in the ayat of the Quran. Now in reality also, such was the case. When there are situations in Islam that Imam Ali was the only protector of the deen and the only protector of Islam. And if he wasn't there, Islam had reached a point of breaking down, of being annihilated. And it was Ali who took Islam out of that danger and brought it out into safety. Look in every battlefield, in every place you see, I give you the example of the Battle of Khandak. In the Battle of Khandak, where a person by the name of Amr ibn Abdu'l-Wad had challenged the Muslims, no one was ready to fight him. He challenged them, no one was ready to fight him. And so Imam Ali, the only one who was willing to fight him. And that was it. All the Muslims were there. All the Kuffar were there. This was the final meeting and the final blow that the Kuffar wanted to deal on the Muslim so that the Muslims can be annihilated once and for all. And at that point, Rasulullah sent Ali. And as Ali was walking towards Amr ibn Abdul Wad, Rasulullah announced to the people, Baradat iman kullahu ila kufri kullahi. Today, as you see this happening, this venue, is where the whole of Iman and the whole of Islam is fighting the whole of Kufr. Meaning that this point is where things and fate is going to be decided for our belief and our faith and our religion. Right now the whole of religion is on the line. In the hands of this young man, Allah trusted him so much that he put the whole of Deen in his hands and said, you go there and you are going to save Islam from annihilation. And Ali went there and he killed the whole of Kufr, killed it. And as he killed it, that's when Rasulullah looked at that, saw, heard that and said, Darabatu Ali yawmul qandak min that strike of Ali on the day of Khandak is greater than the worship of all the worlds and everyone in it put together. Why? Because that worship would be useless if it wasn't for Ali. Ali was the central savior of Islam. He saved Islam from utter annihilation. Ali was that person to do that in Reality Allah, Allah has said in the Quran, He has uh, told us that Imamat is uh, the necessary part of Islam, just like Tawheed is. But in reality also, Ali in every level, in every place and nook and corner, wherever Islam was in danger, took Islam out of its danger and brought it to safety. This was Imam Ali. No better helper can be there for Allah's religion. No better person can be there to save Allah's religion. No greater soul could be found to bring the message of Allah out of any sort of danger to its safety and brought it out there. This was Ali. And that person, if Imam Ali is going to die, it cannot be a normal death also. Because such a person cannot just have a normal person, ordinary person come and kill him. Cannot be some accidental blow. 
in a battlefield where Ali dies. No, if Ali has to go, it has to go. He has to go just like his birth that was in the Kaaba where the Kaaba was split open so that his mother can come in there and his announcement of Imamat that is on the day of Ghadir that was so special. So his death also has to be special. It has to be extraordinary. It has to be memorable. Yes, my friends, the one who kills them cannot be just some accidental person who comes along and kills them. Rasulullah has said this. He told Imam Ali, Atadri man ashkal awwaleen? He says, do you know who is ashkal awwaleen? Ashka means the most wretched, the worst person that you can find on earth. The scum of the scum, if you look all the scum together in a lineup, this person would uh, take the uh, award for the scum of the earth. So, who do you know who the Ashkal Awwaleen are? The most wretched people from the beginning of time? He said, uh, yes, it is the person who killed the camel of Saleh. That story that is mentioned in the Quran. That camel of Saleh, this person who killed it, actually did the killing. That person is the most wretched at the beginning of time. Then Rasulullah asked him, Afatadri man ashkal akhirin? Do you know who is the most wretched of the last people? And Imam Ali says, Allah wa Rasul a'lam. Allah and his messenger know more. Tell me, in other words. He says, "Man yadribuka ala hadhi hatta taqdibu hadhi." In other words, he said that it will be that person who's going to make this beard of yours dyed with your blood. He is not going to be just some normal person. He is going to be the most wretched of all wretched people a killer worthy of killing Imam Ali that person has to be evil the most evil of evil person Abdul Rahman ibn Muljam al Muradi took that place he took that place on the 18th of Ramadan which is tonight Imam Ali slept in the house of his daughter where he was a guest and Ibn Muljim slept in the masjid where he was waiting for Allah's guest. That night Imam Ali spent that night in the house of his daughter Umm Kulthum and there he did tell her as to what was going to happen in the morning. Umm Kulthum told her father, why don't you send someone else? Send someone else there to pray instead of you. Imam Ali said, you cannot escape destiny. You cannot escape fate. You cannot run away from Allah's plan. This is Allah's plan. This is fate. And hence, I must go through that fate. This was a pleasure for Imam Ali. He was in such an excitement that night of meeting his fate. He went through every stage of that night restless. He slept for a while. He woke up. He was restless. Someone asked him, why are you restless? He says, I saw the messenger in my dream. I saw Rasulullah in my dream and he was telling me, Ali, it is time for you to come to me now. I have waited too long and I have been separated from you for too long. Come here. I'm waiting for you and your wife Fatima is waiting for you. It's been a long time, Ali. Imam Ali, as he stepped out of the house he was excited to go there 
there were some ducks that were making noise. He looked at those ducks and he says, nothing can stop me from going to what Allah is calling me to. And he went there, woke up everyone, gave the azan, woke up everyone, even came to Ibn Muljim, woke him up, looked at him. This wasn't the first time that he looked at him. He had seen him before. But this time he looked at him and he said, I know what you're going to do, but I cannot punish you because you haven't done it yet. He then goes and starts his mustaha prayer. The plan of Ibn Muljim was to strike Imam Ali while he's in prayer because Imam Ali is so engrossed in prayer, he doesn't care of anything that is happening around him. Ibn Muljim came there with his sword that sword, the arrangement was made to drench it in poison that will annihilate and it would execute the person who gets this poison inside of him. Any target that gets this poison inside of him is going to eliminate that target. And that poison was used in that sword. And the sword that was drenched in that poison, Ibn Muljim, ran towards Imam Ali as he went into sajda, the first sajda. And as he was getting up, he just struck the head of Imam Ali in such a way that a huge gash came in the head of Imam Ali. The blood started to spurt out of his head. Imam Ali's head was knocked to the ground. As Ibn Muljim struck him, he saw that the sword had gone into his head. That was enough because the poison is now inside. It will do its job. He doesn't have to strike again because the idea was not to kill him with the sword, but to kill him with the poison. That sword was just a means of delivering the poison into the head of Imam Ali. Once the poison was in, Ibn Muljim started running away from there. And then people understood what was going on. Imam Ali now was not able to sit up straight. He was swooning from right to left, right to left. But there was something strange. Ibn Muljam, when he did this, he did not just strike Imam Ali. He struck Islam itself. He did not strike just Imam Ali. He struck justice. He struck freedom. He said, he struck compassion and mercy. No greater helper of Islam would ever be seen. No better leader would ever be found. No kinder guide would ever be born. When Ali knew that the poison is seeping into his system and he knew that this is the end, he just called out saying, Futo bi Rabbil Kaaba, I have, I am successful by the Lord of the Kaaba, I am successful. And Imam Ali started reading this ayat of Surah Taha, Minha khalaknakum wa fiha nu'idukum wa minha nukhrijukum taratan ukhra. From this earth we have created you and we will go back to this earth. We'll make you go back to the earth and we will extract you there a second time and you will be coming towards us. And Allah and Allah has taken, now he's taking Imam Ali. Imam Ali is thanking Allah by saying, Allah, thank you for this. You have given me success in this life. Mahmoud, Bhakki Muhammad, Ya Allah, Bhakki Ali, Ya Fatra Samawad, Bhakki Fatima, Ya Muhsin, Bhakki Hassan, Ya Qadim Ul Hassan, Bhakki Hussain. Thank you for watching Divine Allegiance. We hope you like the show. If you like the show, please go on and hit the like button below. And subscribe to our channel. And share with your family and friends to spread the message. I'm your host, Maulana Baig. Until next time, Wassalamu Alaikum Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuh.